All right, welcome to week two, where we are figuratively setting the sails on our Southeast Asian Kontiki adventure. So this little painting here, I think, is an apt illustration of what we're trying to do. Though tiny in comparison to the scale of the vast ocean on which it will eventually traverse, I think our vessel uh, here on the screen, like the study of Southeast Asian art, comes down to us through an accumulation of knowledge. So let's see what this inherited knowledge can do as we engage with existing scholarship, but also let's explore where this can take us as we journey forth and find our own voice and ways of understanding and interpreting our Southeast Asian cultural past. So the first step uh, to any kind of like art historical work is really visual analytical work, right? It is learning how to sort of like see and then learning how to describe what you're seeing. In this instance, where, where context is unavailable, uh, very often uh, we can often rely on what we know and what we can see. So there are terms that are helpful uh, uh, to at least sort of like uh, gain some familiarity with, right? Uh, especially those uh, that are related to composition. So in this passage that you see here on the screen, uh, for example, uh, uh, one that sticks out to me here is the word contraposing, which I highlighted in blue. Uh, uh, so now this is a term that an art historian would be very familiar with. And then there are also adjectives, such as the one in a green that I've highlighted in green, the word plated to describe a shelter which help us to better understand and see what is the material or the construction of something that we might take for granted. And this is helpful to help understand uh, uh, what are we actually sort of like referring to in the particular image when we talk about the image. On some occasion, uh, it might we might be required to be familiar with terminologies associated with a particular object or an artifact. So uh, what you see here in uh, orange, highlighted in orange, are really the nautical terms uh, describing different parts of uh, the ship, right? Uh, so as you go through uh, read the assigned readings, chances are you're going to encounter a lot of new objects and enter into many different new cultural universes. And there will be a lot of things that are going to be quite unfamiliar to you. Do take the time uh, to uh, list down the terms that you're not familiar with and also put in some effort in finding out what they actually refer to. So in reading something like this, uh, not being an expert on boat building or shipbuilding myself, I was not even equipped to understand what this particular passage means. And it, uh, for, even for someone like me, I'm required to actually sort of like uh, do the highlighting and then do the additional independent searches in order to figure out what a gun wheel is, for example, or what a white beam is. Uh, so uh, this actually helps us uh, to appreciate or understand better what is being described in the text here. Uh, uh, of course, in today, in this day and age, you can do so very easily by searching on the web. Uh, simply search, you know, boat making in Southeast Asia, and uh, the answers, uh, or, or even type in the specific terminology that you're not familiar with, and the answers will, you know, appear before you on the screen. Uh, however, I, understandably, sometimes, uh, you know, uh, having too many answers can result in the fact that things will uh, become even more unclear. So in, in, in those situations, please don't be afraid to ask questions during tutorial, or better yet, use our discussion room on Padlet uh, or, and see if your course mates are able to help you understand better. Okay, so we can always sort of like rely on each other to uh, learn things that we're not so familiar with uh, in the hope that this will help us to gain deeper knowledge on uh, the various things that we're gonna uh, come across in this particular course. Okay, uh, so what we're trying to cover uh, this week is uh, Austronesia. Uh, generally speaking, uh, we, when we speak of Austronesian, it, it describes a language family 
uh, and uh, less so today we don't call uh, or, or we might call it a people right but very often we don't use the word ethnicity or race to describe uh, uh, this particular term uh, which I hope that you will come to agree with me uh, that this idea of ethnicity and race is really entirely fictitious a fictitious mean a fictitious uh, thing that was made up, a concept that was made up in the 19th century uh, or, or 18th and 19th sort of like century. Really, there really, there, when we get down to it, there really only is one race, and that is the human race. So when it comes to language family, I think what the term suggests is that it refers to people who identify uh, as Austronesian. Uh, because they share a similar linguistic structure in the language that they use. And these languages can be as different as you know, Hawaiian uh, with Malay. And yet, within Hawaiian and Malay, they are shared vocabulary. They are similar sort of like vocabularies. Uh, and linguists are sort of like keen to use this as evidences to trace uh, how different cultures that are seemingly so distant and so far apart from one another uh, could be at some point, you know, connected uh, on some level, right? Uh, so uh, when we look at, you know, uh, this map over here, what, we, what you will notice is that uh, what is unique about this, uh, uh, this highlighted geography uh, is that it is not something that is centered on the land, right? Today we might think of bodies of water as borders, or a, or, or, or a place that is uninhabitable uh, as something that actually divides uh, one country from another country. However, in the past, uh, this was not seen as a border, right? The waters were no dividing lines at all. Rather, in many ways, uh, what is suggested here is that they are highways and central to the cultural imagination of the Austronesian people. So, what are the archaeological evidences that we can marshal to even think about it that way? Uh, and for a long time, this has been a really challenging area, principally because of two conditions. Firstly, uh, in a tropical environment, uh, things don't often preserve very well. And humidity leaves very little clues uh, for us to understand our past. Then, of course, being a seafaring culture and a migratory one, uh, Austronesians are generally very mobile. Uh, they're not often settled in a place for a very long time and therefore don't always make things that are meant to last forever. Uh, having said that, there are archaeological evidences and uh, things have sort of like, uh, you know, emerged over uh, 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 over time, uh, they give us a sense of um, what this uh, uh, earlier sort of like seafaring culture was like. Uh, one prominent example that dates back all the way to, uh, you know, 3rd and 2nd century BC are what we call the Dongson bronze drums. Uh, so in this example here on the screen, uh, we see the ship-shaped motifs being carved onto what is essentially a type of ceremonial instruments. These are not only found in one location, but are scattered across different locales. You know, uh, why it's called Dong Son was uh, uh, primarily because it was originally sort of like uh, excavated or discovered in Vietnam, but you would soon sort of like have excavations that reveal that they also uh, uh, existed in Malaya, uh, Java, Sumatra, and all across sort of like Southeast Asia thereby in many ways uh, suggesting that it was an object that was not only prized uh, uh, but highly circulated, right? Uh, you know, what's interesting is today it is still sort of like ceremonially used by a number of different uh, people in South China, right? Uh, specifically the Zhuang Yi and Miao people. Uh, if you go to Guang Guangxi, then you see there's a Zhuang Museum there and uh, and, and the Dongson drum uh, features very prominently uh, a, a, as a cultural symbol of, 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 uh, of the Zhuang people uh, through the museum representation. So uh, not only is the ship-shaped sort of like motif 
uh, something that is important or central uh, to the imagination in many of the relief carvings found on uh, excavated Dong Sun drum, the fact that these drums were so scattered across uh, different locales really helps to confirm uh, how mobile uh, people were already uh, back in the third and second century, uh, and that there was a lively sort of like inter-regional trade happening in this part of the world. Uh, now, seafaring imagery was not only a literal representation of a common mode of physical transportation or a representation of a lively and very active sort of like uh, uh, trade relation uh, that was interregional in nature. Uh, the seafaring sort of imagery also takes on metaphorical and spiritual meaning. Uh, in the Manungbul Ja that you see here, uh, uh, now uh, in the collection of the National Museum of Anthropology in Manila. This is an example of how burials in cave complex further inland sometimes help us to preserve a worldview and a cosmology that might not immediately relate to its current environment of being in the inland area. Here, the Manungulja is topped with two figures. And, seems to, uh, and you see these two figures seem to be sort of like using a uh, and, and, and what's happening here is that the jar seems to be using boat paddling as a metaphor for the movement between this life and the next life. Now, given that this is a burial jar, uh, the, uh, one can infer by reading this particular imagery of uh, 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 someone undertaking a sort of like sh uh, a journey across the sea uh, as represented by two figures. Uh, sitting in a boat, with one of them paddling the boat, and then, more importantly, as you look uh, uh, at the ornamentation uh, that surrounds the lid and, and, and top rim of the jar, you see them in a curlicue form that is reminiscent or suggestive of waves, of ocean waves, or wave-like sort of like pattern, uh, as if they're really sort of like, you know, moving across uh, from one domain or one world into another world. Uh, so you see here the front figure is someone who's being sort of like fairy, perhaps indicating uh, that of the deceased person, while the person behind in the rear is holding a steering paddle, directing the boat, uh, and the soul of the presumably the dead man to the afterlife perhaps indicative of some kind of, uh, he, he plays the role of a conductor between different worlds. Uh, and therefore, the bone that rests inside this burial jar with such uh, a, a powerful and, and vivid sort of like imagery immediately sort of like connects something that is, uh, uh, that uh, everyone back then would be very familiar with, namely uh, shipping or, or or traveling by boat as a, uh, as a principal mode of trans, uh, transportation and adding a different sort of like, another sort of like cosmological and spiritual sort of like layer of meaning uh, to this everyday kind of like activity, thereby creating a very interesting kind of like uh, uh, mixture between uh, what is sacred and what is quotidian or what is the everyday. Okay. Uh, similarly, in the Nias Cave, uh, now known as the uh, Kain Hitam Mortuary, uh, known also as the Kain Hitam sort of like mortuary, uh, a, a discovery made by uh, Tom Harrison in the 1960s uh, included a 46 meter panel along the west wall, acting as a backdrop mural to the to a, a row of sort of like a hollowed out uh, wooden boat coffins that were arranged uh, in an east-west sort of like axis uh, inside the cave complex. So uh, in, this, uh, 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 in this rubbing uh, that you see here on, on, on the screen of the, of the sort of cave, of the cave painting, uh, of note really, uh, is that in some of the sort of like barahus, uh, 
or the, the kind of like uh, boat vessel that we see here that takes a crescent-like sort of shape, uh, you often find, or this was more sort of like prominent, you often find that uh, what it carries is also a very interesting sort of like motif, which is a motif of like a tree or a tree of life emerging out of some of these vessels, right? So in, some, in that sense, I think uh, uh, some scholars have suggested that Gain Hitam as a site is uh, in many ways a very organized kind of deathscape. You know, uh, uh, taking the uh, the cue from the word landscape, but uh, really describing how this kind of like landscape is really about the subject of death. Uh, this kind of like deathscape, which uh, you know goes back to more than a thousand years, uh, we see the placement of material objects, including everyday sort of like objects such as uh, you know. Uh, your, your clothing, uh, your, yeah, sometimes you can find even sort of like cooking utensils and things like that. Next to models of sort of like death ships themselves uh, in relation to the rock art and the cave mouth of, uh, that remains, uh, that gives you a sense of this sort of like intermixture between the, the everyday and the sacred as well. So that you also sort of like uh, bring uh, so some aspects of your sort of like existence in the present world uh, 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 is also sort of like detained or, or carries over into the afterlife. And these two sort of like worlds are not always uh, as clearly sort of like uh, divided as we like to think uh, today where, you know, we don't have really an access to this other world, right? So. Uh, just to sort of like join another example, so consider like how in your in you know in, even in Chinese culture you would, or in Taoist sort of like belief system where you would sort of like burn effigies or mansions or cars or iPhones to the dead, right? Paper paper models of these things, right? So these are sort of like indication that in many sort of like uh, religions of the past, this division between this world and the afterlife is not as uh, as fixed as how we sort of like see them today. Rather, the porosity is represented best by the passage that one conducts using a boat across a body of water. So body of water is liquid. It is sort of like fluid. It, uh, it is a channel rather than uh, uh, a gate that closes off one world from the other world. Right? Okay? Uh, so. When we bring all these sort of like examples into cons consideration and comparisons, uh, what we begin to see is that uh, that slowly over time, gradually, a worldview begins to sort of like emerge, uh, and this might be informed by you know an underlying sort of like cosmic principle, uh, and the work of structuralism yeah, is about sort of like trying to understand what is that principle structure that governs a particular sort of like mode of sort of seeing or engaging with the world. And uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, scholars who take this sort of like approach to studying the past often sort of like uh, recognize the ship as an important sort of like vehicle that moves us between worlds uh, uh, as much as it is uh, it was a sort of like a standard mode of transportation and was very much part of the everyday uh, uh, of Austronesian people who uh, lived in this part of the world and, and saw water as the primary sort of like cultural, uh, within their sort of like primary sort of like cultural imagination. Uh, but not just sort of like ship, but also the tree of life that represents the cosmological sort of structure of the Austronesian belief system and these two then sort of like meet in some ways uh, when we sort of like bring all these different materials together to get a sense of what uh, what are the underlying sort of like principle uh, uh, of what we consider as Austronesian culture right this kind of sort of like long durée reading of art uh, helps us to see what uh, the German historian, uh, German culture historian, uh, Abi Barber, calls the Nachleben uh, Antique, or the afterlife of the antiquity, 
So, after, so rather than think of time as periodic and the different periods uh, have different cultural expressions and you know Renaissance is different from Baroque, Baroque is different from uh, uh, the neoclassical and neoclassical is therefore different from the modern. Uh, this approach of recognizing the afterlife uh, uh, is more interested or invested in detecting traces of the past that continues to resonate and live on in the present day with form and meaning often reconfigured, reshaped or recast. And this is often done in a very playful sort of like manner. So the role of a cultural historian in this way is really to sort of like try to uh, trace back the steps and try to understand what is at stake here when uh, we think of images as uh, having this transformative sort of like life of its own that exists in a very sort of like, uh, that exists over time in a very playful manner with its meaning and its form uh, constantly changing, constantly evolving, constantly sort of like open to sort of like new ways that it, is try it can sort of like express itself in a different sort of like manner, okay? Uh, in this way, while a Torajan house on the highlands of Sulawesi might be a location that is today quite distant away from the sea, but also very distant from this seafaring past that we have been talking about. Now, given that uh, uh, even with the oldest sort of like uh, surviving Torajan house today being closer to actually our time than uh, 2,000 years ago, when placed next to the relief of a Dongsen drum that existed since 2,000 years ago, or representation of a Tian house in, that you can find in Yunnan, you can immediately see that in terms of the roof structure, there are formal affinities that suggest deep, long, deeper, longer kind of historical ties that sometimes are not recorded in forms of writing. So writings are not the only means we are able to sort of like refer to in order to establish uh, certain historical facts. Therefore, paying attention to form is just as equally important as uh, uh, being able to learning how to sort of like consult uh, historical textual records. Uh, in fact, I don't want to set them up as entirely uh, antithetical to one another or they're not mutually exclusive. Uh, I see them as sort of like complementary sort of like methods uh, and, and all good art historical work tends to sort of rely on both methods in order to help us understand the past better. Okay, so this is uh, a, a sample of the lecture that I've done. I am also sort of like sharing you a second part of the uh, uh, of our uh, of uh, of what I was going to sort of like uh, deliver as a lecture in the form of uh, a slide presentation. Um, I want to get a sense of you, which is a better sort of like mode of delivery. Uh, what do you think helps you to learn better, okay? Uh, whether Simon talking or pointing to things in the fashion of an old, long-winded lecturer, or perhaps uh, more kind of like a curated slides, activities, or sort of curated content of the, from the internet for you to discover things at your own pace. Uh, which do you think is a better sort of like uh, uh, model of delivering the, uh, you know, what we're supposed to learn? this week, uh, please feel free to sort of like respond in the Padlet uh, discussion room. Uh, I'll also sort of like run a poll next Tuesday uh, during the tutorial. Or if you have any better suggestion besides these two that I've sort of like highlighted because they're quite sort of like uh, exclusive, uh, maybe there's a middle ground somewhere, uh, please share them on, on, on the discussion room. And um, I'll try, sort of like try to sort of find a way to design the course a little bit better so that we all can sort of like learn productively during this uh, difficult period. Thank you.